I, uh, I was asked to talk today about the issue of race. Um, so first I want to thank them for giving me the easy topic <laughs> of the day. My first observation for all of you, I think, to John and to Nira and, and the CAP crew and to all of those who are with us today is that you can't really uh, talk about race without talking about America. And you certainly can't talk about America without talking about freedom or liberty or race because they all seem to be inextricably linked. And the first recognition is that this country was born uh, in contradiction uh, from our inception. And it has uh, plagued us for a long period of time. Uh, as you know, I just finished 30 years of a tour of duty in public service in our country, 16 years as a state legislator, six as a lieutenant governor, uh, and eight serving my beloved city and our hometown, the city of New Orleans, one of the great cities in the world. It is a city that, as you know, has suffered a tremendous tragedy and triumph, from the BP oil spill to Katrina to Rita to Ike to Gustav, the National Recession. We wondered when the locusts were coming, but we've been figuratively to hell and back. Uh, but we are a city whose great contradictions are manifest. Our incredible beauty, our diversity. We actually, in a very special way, personify uh, one of our nation's mottos, e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one. New Orleans is a 300-year-old city where everything that we hold dear, uh, our jazz, our architecture, our gumbo, the rest of our music, our way of life, is actually created by throwing everything into the pot, different cultures, different tastes. And when it comes out, the sum is always better than its individual parts. It's in a uniquely American city where we are constantly reaching for more, for that perfect union that we all aspire to be. And sometimes, although it's felt far from our reach, we keep pushing, we keep reaching, we keep striving for more because of that insatiable desire for more or for better, or like they say from my neighborhood, for more better. <laughs> but we've always been a mirror of the country as well. It's a city that sold more humans into slavery than anywhere else in the United States of America, a city that enshrined separate but equal, a city with the highest incarceration and the highest murder rates, a city where we left people stranded with nowhere to go, no way to get out, when a Category 5 storm barreled down on the U.S. All of us gasped at the sight of losing a great American city, and we saw fellow Americans on the steps of the Superdome and Convention Center, and we all almost at once in unison said, who left those people there? How could we do that? And the honest answer, the truth, is that we all did. Our nation's policies did policies that too often were guided by race and institutional racism. At our peril, we cannot be afraid of our nation's truth. We have to confront it because that is what real patriots do. That is what America does, always striving to be better. So I ask you to think about when we're sworn under oath in court, they ask us to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, right? And the reason they do that, it's because if you don't tell the whole truth, it can often lead to either a half-truth or a lie by omission. And when you do that, something gets left behind. And in the history of America, it's our fellow Americans. Millions of people take this oath every day, and yet we as a country have never, ever fully reckoned with the whole of our past, specifically as it relates to race in a way that honors the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And as a result, the vestiges of Jim Crow and the resulting segregation that resulted is alive and well today. From the disparity in our health outcomes to increasing housing segregation and the disenfranchisement of voters as well as voter suppression. The vestiges of Jim Crow are in fact alive and well in the transportation systems in this country in all shapes and sizes, in the criminal justice system, in the public education system, in the financial world of banking and credit and mortgage, all of it. 
You can't ignore this. You have to confront it. But it's out there like landmines buried waiting to explode and stop people's progress forward. And the truth is that the words of our founders and forefathers that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, liberty and justice for all, and even to e pluribus unum, even today ring hollow for many of our fellow Americans. So in my opinion, we can't fully fulfill America's promise moving forward to that more perfect union that we desire, that we all wish to be. If we're not honest about how we got to this place and how imperfect we happen to be at the moment. That's why we took the monuments down and essentially that's what the monument speech was about. How do we confront, thank you. It, call, it called the question for the country really on how do we confront and how do we correct our past not to lay blame but so that we can move forward and create a better country for all of us. It is, you already know, a long and winding road. It is not a straight line. And race can be a scary topic for all of us. We really don't know how to talk about it, which is probably why we don't do it. But here's one of the things I've learned. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. You can't go over it. You have to go through it, or you will stay stuck in it. You have got to find a way to get to the other side, wherever your other side may be. So telling the truth about our past and the present is actually just the first step. It's just the beginning. But I also believe and have learned that the six most important words in the English language are, I am sorry, followed by, I forgive you. They have to coincide with each other. They, in fact, are bookends. Symmetry can be a beautiful thing sometimes. It, in fact, takes a conversation on both sides. And that doesn't mean that anyone in this room, any one person, is at fault. Too often, you see, the discussions about race become confrontational because they start with the idea of blame and fault. Now, that conversation can go on for another 300 years, and I'm sure that it will. But as that conversation goes on, I've also learned that I don't have to solve that problem or find that answer. Because even though I may not be able to pinpoint exactly whose fault it is, I'm pretty sure whose responsibility it is to fix it and to heal the nation. And that would be everybody. Because without everybody, it's not going to get done. Let me be clear that a person's individual words and actions today should be absolutely called out and addressed. The rise of white nationalism and white supremacy should concern everybody and should be confronted aggressively and made clear that it has no quarter at the table of democracy. But we should also challenge the institutions and the policies that exist that have kept us apart for generations. And the failure to do that will keep us looking backward rather than forward. You all know this, the first American slaves were brought to Jamestown in 1619, over 400 years ago. And of course, that act, that singular act, is still shaping institutions in America today. Last year, I had the incredible honor of participating in the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission. If you don't know what it is, I would encourage you to find out. If you do know what it is, go back and read the report. I'm going to tell you now, spoiler alert, it's not going to make you feel good about our country. That commission, you see, challenged the nation to admit that racism had been institutionalized in America and had become a driving force and the cornerstone for inequality. So, of course, we did what we do all the time when confronted with a hard truth. We ignored it. Sounds familiar. It should. We're doing the same thing with climate change. One of the main conclusions was that the United States was moving towards two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. And of course, this growing segregation and inequality fueled unrest. It fueled dislocation. And it reminded us of a phrase we had always heard before, that where there is no justice, there is no peace. 
I heard a lot about justice and peace in marches from activists, especially in the wake of Ferguson, Baltimore, shootings in East Baton Rouge, even in New Orleans around the monuments and counter protests. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. When I was a child during the 60s, I took that as an implied threat. I heard it when I was a kid to mean something like, if you don't give me what's rightfully mine, I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to take it. I didn't really understand it. And as I got a little bit older and I began to think about the deeper meaning and as my experience revealed more to me, I, I came to understand that really what it meant was a statement of truth. When things are not fair, it actually creates alienation and dislocation. And there cannot be peace in alienation. When people are alienated from each other, they can't share with each other what it is they have, what it is they need, and we're all the worst for it. You see, peace is not just the absence of physical violence. Where there is no communion, all you're left with on a good day is peaceful segregation. And we are all much worse when we are not working together. The other thing to remember that has been told to us so many times, but maybe we don't really fully understand, is that poverty can be a form of violence. So is not having access to health care or having a real job so that you too can, for your family, have a job or build generational wealth over time. There is institutional violence, as Robert Kennedy told us many, many years ago, that comes without there being any justice. So where there is no justice, there can be no peace. And we are going to continue to stay in stasis and not get any better until we understand what that means. And we cannot move forward unless and until we have an honest conversation about the past and then actually chart a pathway forward. Here's a truth. We all come to the table of democracy in the United States as equals. That's the aspiration. That is what makes America great. That is what everybody has a right to. That is what everybody is entitled to. But in order to get there, you've got to bring somebody else along with you. This isn't what we merely aspire to. It is a truth, in my opinion, that cannot be denied. We are all better together. We benefit from each other. We learn from each other. And we go through sorrow and pain and tragedy and triumph together. Now, again, just like no justice, no peace, that's not a threat. You see, this is not a playground game where if you don't give me what I want, you're not going to get what you want because I'm not going to give it to you. It's not a sacrifice or a zero-sum game. If you win, I lose. It's an invitation, an open hand for us to do better, to understand that we all benefit when we're at the table as equals. I only understand that today because of what we faced in New Orleans with the monuments. I should have taken, it should not take that kind of ordeal or a tragedy like Katrina to wake us up and bring us together because we already know what we are supposed to do. A child will tell you this. A child told me this in Kentucky the other day. She said, Mr. You know, I didn't like that, by the way. <laughs> she said, Mr., you know that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity isn't. Why does it take a 16-year-old to tell the adults of America what we obviously know is true? We don't have a deficit of ideas in this country. We have a deficit of willpower. We have a deficit of courage. Now, as a Southerner, and I love the South, we're a place of faith, we're a place of family, we're a place of country, we're a place of lazy, lazy rivers, good food, good music, good fellowship. Y'all haven't been there, you ought to come. <laughs> but I feel a special obligation as a Southerner, and particularly a white Southerner, to tackle the history of white supremacy and our history. Last year, I launched in partnership with the Emerson Collective E Plura Basunum Fund to help fulfill America's promise of justice and opportunity by breaking down the barriers that divide us by race and by class. We actually have spent the last nine months traveling extensively across the South. We've been to 28 counties. We have been to 13 states to try to find bold and effective solutions to breaking down the legacy of Jim Crow so that we can actually create a new pathway forward, not only for the South, 
but for the country, because as you may not know yet, where goes the South, so goes the country. We've been there before. We heard that white people lack an understanding of the scale of racism in America, that the erosion of quality public education is a product of long-standing racial injustices and a cause of ongoing racial and economic inequality, a powerful force of division in our communities that continues today because we continue to live segregated lives, in case you have not been paying attention. We saw that where local leaders openly prioritize diversity and inclusion, there is more hope, there is more optimism in the community's future. But we also saw how political leadership and the media have power to set a permissive tone for racist behaviors and to reinforce stereotypes. Across race and class, everybody wants the same thing. People really want to work hard. They'll work two, they'll work three jobs. But what really bothers them is they have to work hard to stay in place and they have to sacrifice their valuable time with their families and their friends to do it, which is why they are so agitated. They believe that we live in a who-you-know economy, an economy that is rigged against the working people and no matter how hard they work, they cannot get ahead. That is what they say to us if we would just listen. In other words, they know if the economy is so good and the stock market's so great and everybody's got a job, why everybody's agitated? They know. They sense that something is broken. They sense that the system is rigged against them, and you know they are right. And it has been for a very, very long period of time. So I want you to think about it for a moment. This is not rocket scientist. It doesn't require somebody to see what can't be seen. This system works the way it does because it was designed this way, which means that the design is defective. And if you want to fix it, then you have to redesign it if you want to achieve another goal and another end. This doesn't mean that you have to design a system where I take from you and give it to somebody else. It means being thoughtful about making changes to the way things have always been, thinking about redesigning it for the way it should have always been had we gotten it right the first time. I mean, just think about it like this. If all of the kids are not invited, or the family members, to the kitchen table for dinner, the experience is always different and with a worse for it. Everybody deserves a seat at the family table. As intentional as we have been, in this country about designing laws and institutions that kept us apart, we have to be that intentional about bringing people together. So looking to 2020 and beyond, it's time to force the conversation on race in America. There are many people, maybe people in this room, that have advocated that we should reject discussions about racial identity and tough discussions about race. I strongly disagree with that. I think that we could not be more wrong. With Donald Trump in the White House, there actually can't ever be a better time than we've had in our lives to confront this nation's history and truth about race as a means of bringing people together rather than separating us. We can tackle the toughest challenges of this country one way, and only one way, and that's by facing them telling the truth about them, and making a commitment to change them. For generations, our diversity, our multiculturalism, has been seen as one of our nation's greatest strengths. One of our nation's mottos out of many, we are one. E pluribus unum. It's hard to say, but you know what? It's really, really easy to understand. That is what this country is based on, and yet that idea, the foundation of this nation, is being questioned by those that are in charge today. And they're doing it aggressively. And I think they're wrong. Elections, you see, are about choice. And choice matters. We're beginning to painfully understand that today. And so what we choose to do is going to matter about where we end up. We need leaders who see public service as a calling and as a vocation. We need leaders whose political philosophy is tied to a greater ethos rooted in common sacrifice 
in shared responsibility. We need leaders who can discern when they must do the hard things for the sake of what is just and what is right. We can, in fact, be a nation of law and order, but we're also capable at the same time of being a nation of justice and mercy. That is well within our wheelhouse. We need leaders who will face the truth and will lead us to a new path forward. One of the other things that I have learned from my work is that this road is long and the path is arduous. There are going to be ups and downs, but you have to keep going one step at a time. Now, while I still have hope in my heart that Dr. King was right, as President Obama often said, that the arc of the Moore universe bends toward justice, I am equally sobered to the fact, and more sure today than I ever was, that that arc does not bend on its own, and in fact, can be bent backwards if you let it, which is happening today. And so as this all comes into stark relief for us and for the nation, the choice seems to be pretty clear. You're either going to go backwards, comma again, or you're going to go forward. And I believe that the choice should be clear for all of us in this country, and that is where we all come in. And at the end of the day, it is just a moment, a very important moment, not the only one we will ever have. But don't be confused that this is not one of those moments, because it is, where we can either go backwards or we can go forward. It's time for all of us to make that choice. Thank you very much.